Okay. So welcome to a public forum on US politics and the left hosted by Platypus. The Platypus Affiliated Society established in December 2006 organizes reading groups, public fora, research and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old left, the 1920s to 1930s, the new left, 1960s to 1970s, and post-political left, the 1980s to 1990s. And we do all this to investigate the, the possibilities for emancipatory politics today. You can learn more about our activities or find a chapter local to you by visiting our website. That is platypus1917.org. And I just wanted to say a quick um, explanation of what our group does and why we're hosting this conversation today, and then we'll, we'll get started with it. So when Platypus formed in 2006 as a reading group between students and faculty in Chicago, those original students were heavily involved in the anti-war protests going on at the time and the immigration rights demonstrations. And at these demonstrations, our students encountered veteran organizers from the new left generation. The old 60s and 70s radicals insisted on one thing, that the next generation learn from previous mistakes. These new leftists kept insisting that the same stumbling blocks and obstacles be acknowledged and overcome by the young people new to the left in the 21st century. And Platypus took this atmosphere of critical self-examination as its raison d'etre. Today, Platypus meets a lot of young people. Uh, they're disenchanted with the existing status quo and they know something is wrong, but they're not exactly sure what is wrong and they want to work through their thinking. They're looking for a group that encourages questioning of thought taboos and that takes nothing for granted. And if that description matches you, please be in touch. But this is why we invite the left to campus, or in this case, during the age of COVID, we invite them on Zoom. In the spirit of learning from the past to help students experience the present. Now, Platypus, unlike other organizations, we do not host panels to hear positions that we agree with. In fact, we hope for some product productive disagreement um, amongst the speakers. We encourage the audience to pay close attention and to ask thoughtful questions. There is something to learn from a Platypus panel that may be more than the sum of its parts. It's that audience interaction that um, is one of the key things we look for. With this in mind, I will read the panel description that we circulated to the panelists, and then I'll introduce our four speakers for tonight. So the future after the election, what is left? This past US election season saw an array of positions on the left concerning the outcome that might follow from either party's victory. Among them, were, there were some who openly supported Joe Biden as the lesser of two evils. Others opposed Biden by casting a vote for Trump or a third party candidate like Howie Hawkins. Uh, Howie Hawkins, actually, we had speak on this very same panel back in 2017. Still others followed from the uh, abstentionist line by not voting at all. Many of those who voted for Biden did so under the assumption that the Democrats were a broadly center left party with vaguely social democratic tendencies who might be pushed to reverse neoliberal policies and stave off measures of austerity. Some, while generally less optimistic, endorsed Biden on the premise that organizing a mass movement against capitalism would be easier with the Democrats in power. Others argued that Biden had done nothing to deserve election offered no hope for either change or progress moving forward. And the rest of the left chose instead to eschew electoral politics altogether. Now that the election for the leader of the free world has resulted in a Biden victory, we are afforded a brief chance to critically evaluate the prospects for the left's transition into the next four years. And we ask the panelists to consider these questions. What is different today from four years ago, when Trump's election seemed a departure from eight years under Obama. 
Did the last four years signal progress or regress for the left? How will the terrain shift for the left under this president? What does the future hold for a left caught in the stale air of the status quo? Is the goal of the left still socialism in the 21st century? And if so, what is socialism and how can we achieve it? After the election, what is left? Now to introduce our speakers in their speaking order. So first we have Patricia Connor. Welcome, Patricia. Patricia Connor is a member of the Progressive Labor Party. She is also in Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 689. Connor worked for 11 years as a bus operator and station attendant for the WMATA, WMATA, and was the shop steward executive board member of the Local 689 for six years. Her group led a number of struggles within the union to fight against racist criminal background checks, the selling out of younger members through degradation of benefits, and harsh disciplinary procedures that kept workers scared for their jobs. Her current fight is against layoffs due to budget issues caused by this COVID pandemic. And Patricia, the, the PLP, they recently published an article on Biden's victory, and it said something super interesting that, quote, communists must cut through the noise uh, and that the PLP has always been clear that the liberal misleaders like Obama, Biden, and Harris are in fact the greatest dangers, even more so than the Republicans. And why? Because they're more effective in preventing our class from seeing the catastrophic reality of capitalism, end quote. I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on how the radical left can cut through this noise and not remain beholden to this status quo that keeps misleading us. Next, we have David Duhalde. Nice to have you here, David. David is a longtime democratic socialist activist who got started as a campus activist with what is now called the Young Democratic Socialist of America. David, when was that? Do you remember? I remember very well, 2003. 2003, so that's quite yeah. some time ago. That's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, David has served as a DSA's national youth organizer and deputy director. Duhalde also served as political director of the Bernie Sanders-inspired Our Revolution. Today, he is the vice chair of the DSA Fund, a, 503, a 501c3 educational nonprofit. And also, he serves on the DSA Steering Committee of the International Committee. Did I get that correct? Okay. Um, David, with you having been around the DSA throughout the entire millennial left's history, um, from the anti-war period, through the 2008 recession, to Occupy Wall Street, through the Sanders campaign and the DSA boom, and now to, to Biden's election, I, I very much look forward to your perspective on where the left has been and where it is going, because you've seen a lot of it. Next, we have Pat Noble. Hi, Pat. Pat has been the national co-chair of the Socialist Party USA since 2015 and party secretary for the Socialist Party of New Jersey since 2011. He is also founder of the Socialist Party's Central New Jersey Local since 2011. Uh, Noble has also been elected to three terms on his local school board. And most recently, Noble was a supporter of the 2020 Hawkins Walker Left Unity campaign. And Pat, your party has a long and storied legacy, and I would be very much interested in hearing how you evaluate the tradition of, you know, U.S. greats like Eugene Debs, for example, and what you think today's socialist movement could learn from its own history. And finally, we have Chris Slos. Hi, Chris. Chris Slos grew up in Wise, Virginia, in Appalachian country. He has been organizing with the Richmond Democratic Socialists of America since 2016. He is also a published writer for Draw Magazine and Quail Bale Magazine. And you can find his current writing efforts at christopherslose.substack.com. Now, Chris, when you spoke on the topic of police brutality for a platypus panel back in August, you suggested that voting is a thing, but it's not the thing, um, that you can vote or not vote, and either could be important for your long-term goal of achieving socialism. And I, I, that suggestion, you know, ultimately was about um, 
we need a vision for and an education towards a society beyond the confines of today. I thought those were very good comments. I'd be interested in investigating that perspective um, today. You know, what ways can we discuss the election that do not amount to mere electoral efforts um, and what you might make of that? Absolutely. So, so we have these four wonderful panelists. I look forward to their remarks. Each of you will have up to eight minutes for opening remarks. I'll, I'll set my timer. Um, you can all go through your opening remarks and then you'll have uh, a round of responses up to three minutes each where I will invite the panelists. You can ask each other questions. You can say, you know, I disagreed with this or I agreed with this that my fellow panelists said. Um, I will unmute and signal you when your time is nearing its end. After the first two rounds are over, then the floor will be open to the audience for Q&A. And I'm only going to call on questions. If you have more of a comment, then I encourage you to work it into a short piece of writing and submit it to our International Open Submission Journal, the Platypus Review. We get a lot of wonderful short piece submissions like that. Um, you can either un, uh, you cannot call on me to unmute you, or you can type your question in the chat. I'm happy to do either one. Uh, to, it, right now it's 613. We will conclude the event within two hours, and it'll be followed by a post-panel chat room. There's a different Zoom link, so I'm going to throw that in the chat very quickly. All of our panelists are invited to participate if they'd like to. Um, otherwise, um, anyone else in the audience? Oh, sorry. I've just messaged people privately. Here it is. There it is. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to say is I am your moderator. I'm also going to be a sort of acupuncturist. Um, I, I will poke and prod you on occasion if I think you say something really interesting and that the audience should hear more. So with that said, are we, are we ready to begin? Absolutely. Perfect. All right, Patricia, if you'd like to get us started. Okay. Thank you for having me. Um, so as the moderator said, as Ethan said, I'm a member of the Progressive Labor Party, a revolutionary communist organization that is fighting to build a world free of exploitation, war, racism, and sexism through a revolutionary overthrow of capitalist governments in the United States and around the world, and replacing them with the dictatorship of the proletariat, also known as workers' power. A mass working class party is the key organization needed to lead the working class's destruction of racist capitalism and build a new world. To get rid of capitalism, such a party must be disciplined and with a base in important industrial sectors of the capitalist economy, including manufacturing, transportation, agriculture, healthcare, and education. It also must be building a base among rank and file soldiers, sailors, and Marines to ensure mutinies in support of revolution. As part of that overall strategy, I work for Metro and I'm an active member of ATU Local 689, We've helped lead many reform struggles through the union and try to push the union to take on larger social issues such as imperialist war and police brutality. The workers at Metro can be a leading force for change in our society and the PLP is building that power. Once revolutionary ideology becomes broadly accepted among transit workers and others, our ability to seize power and crush capitalism will become closer to fruition. The strategy I've outlined is in essence the same regardless of who wins elections, since the candidates all represent capitalism with some marginal differences among them about how to rule. It is from a class analysis that we must dissect what happened with the election of Biden. The elections do not change the class relations of capitalist society. Biden was clearly the choice of finance capital. This is the long-term industrial imperialist capitalist centered in the barons of Wall Street like JP Morgan Chase and including major industrialists like Exxon Mobil and General Motors. These capitalists viewed Trump as too much of a destabilizing factor. Trump too clearly exposed the racist nature of the system, which the ruling class has been attempting to cover up or distract from. We could discuss some of the policy differences between Trump and Biden, but those differences are very superficial. Issues like immigration policy, police funding, war and defense spending, healthcare, racism, climate change, all will remain fundamentally unchanged under Biden, even if a few of the more outrageous executive orders of Trump are canceled. Capitalism cannot solve these problems for the working class. In fact, it creates them and constantly reproduces them. The growing rivalry between the United States and Chinese imperialists is intensifying. 
while it's currently primarily an economic fight with China steadily gaining economic power, both through rapid internal economic growth and through such policies as the Belt and Road Initiative and its substantial investments in Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. While the US share of world markets shrinks, the possibility of an actual physical war is growing. With Democrats in control, the rhetoric may change, but the US efforts to reassert its domination in world economic, political, and military affairs will continue. This means intensified attacks on workers' wages and benefits as the US capitalist government increases defense spending. In contrast to the conventional wisdom that the election of Biden was a victory over fascism, in fact, his election brings the opportunity for increased fascism in the United States and around the world. And first of all, fascism is not defeated by voting and electoral politics. Fascism is what happens when capitalism is in crisis and both the ruling class and the working class have to be disciplined in order for the crisis to be resolved through imperialist war. The working class is disciplined with attacks on the left, the left being socialists and communists, not the Democrats and liberals, police and economic terror, and an encouragement of extreme nationalism. The ruling class is disciplined so that any members of the ruling class who aren't in agreement with contributing to the war effort are crushed or brought to heel to contribute. The liberals in the United States understand that war is necessary to US capitalism and empire, but they prefer that to fight that war with a diverse army and so use identity politics to pretend to address racism. The liberals show their attempts to discipline the ruling class when they try to keep the tech billionaires in check with lawsuits against Google as a monopoly, or when they attempt to increase the tax rate on millionaires, Biden's national tax plan, or Pritzker's failed fair tax in Illinois. The liberals are also plenty willing to discipline the working class, as we've seen Democrat mayors across the country encourage police violence against protesters while protecting economic interests. The Chicago mayor lifting the bridges to protect the downtown during the summer protests is one obvious example, and failing to provide almost any economic relief to the working class during this pandemic. So since the liberals are plenty willing to contribute to the rise of fascist nationalistic policies, articles demonizing China are a constant, and the liberals are the architects of both mass incarceration and mass deportations, electing Biden is not a blow against fascism. As long as the Democrats can keep the working class under control, capitalism will be maintained. Trump's rhetoric was more openly racist, but his isolationist policies and his tax changes to let the rich, rich contribute even less are both contrary to what is needed for further wars in the future. It's hard to predict exactly what will happen on the world stage as China continues to rise and the US continues to falter, but war will be an inve inevitable outcome at some point. And we already see some fascist tactics being used by the police when workers rebel. As communist ideas grow and workers resist oppression, the, crash, the class struggle intensifies, fascism might become a better option for the ruling class. That's why it's best to fight to keep white nationalists and neo-Nazi groups in check. Right now, there is actually some evidence that the defeat of Trump might have demobilized and disarmed some workers who would otherwise be protesting. Based on the small turnout of anti-racist fighters a few weeks ago, compared to the thousands of MAGA supporters who also intend to return on December 12th. Elections serve an ideological purpose to the ruling class, to give the working class the illusion of power. Widespread celebrations of the victory of Biden or Obama before him reflects the extent to which workers have bought into this illusion. Voting is not how change happens. Change happens when large groups of workers take to the streets and demand change. In the 1920s, the Supreme Court ruled that unions were considered a monopoly and therefore cannot exist. Workers rebelled and held strikes and the Supreme Court changed their mind. Voting also obscures the class nature of our society by funneling workers' energy and resources into sucking up to politicians instead of organizing with other workers and students. Rebellions and strikes are the driving force for social change and building a movement that can carry out these actions is key to defeating the coming attacks on our class and instead going on to the offensive to crush the racist capitalist ruling class and its government. Fighting racism is the key to building working class power. The legacy of slavery and racism in America has made race not merely an issue of identity, but integral to the discussion of economics and class. Furthermore, capitalism thrives on both class and racial divisions and cannot be seriously discussed without also speaking about racism. Multiracial unity is the key to working class power. It requires concerted organizing against structural racism, never easy fights to win. For example, at Metro, the fight against racist background checks 
in hiring and retention took two years and then only a limited lawsuit led to some relief. But the fight against racism has an anti-racist multiplier effect. All workers benefit when we take on racism. This is true in wages, incarceration, police brutality, education, and healthcare. After all, white workers suffer in these same areas of oppression and are helped when anti-racist victories are won. We can organize society in a way to provide for all workers around the world. Capitalism is not the end of progress for humanity, but to move towards a better future, we need to build a revolutionary party, a party that engages in the day-to-day -day struggle of workers, students, and soldiers, but that also builds communist ideas among the masses on the road to revolution. As the Howard University students chanted during their 12-day occupation of the administration building two years ago, we are unstoppable, a better world is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patricia. Perfect timing. Um, uh, <laughs> next, we will have uh, David. Thanks, and I'll watch the clock uh, carefully, so feel free to cut me off. Um, I'm a stickler for time too, so I respect Patty for doing that. Um, so I think that what I will note is one major question has been resolved um, in the past week, and that is Joe Biden is going to be the next president of the United States. So that is, to me, an important blow for what I would describe as a uh, neo-fascistic, uh, new confederacy movement um, in the United States um, that was represented by Trump, uh, Pence, and the Republican Party as of now. Um, and that poses uh, some interesting questions for the left uh, for the next few years. So I'm gonna reflect on, I'm gonna make three points shortly, uh, but I really stuck my remarks to thinking about the excellent question that the slide was offered about what does this mean for the future? Um, so what got me thinking is that Joe Biden has said, we'll see if he holds himself to it, that he may be a one term president uh, which essentially leaves uh, Kamala Harris, uh, the incoming vice president, as the front runner for the Democratic Party nominee uh, in 2024, uh, at the earliest, maybe earlier, if something happens to Biden, or 2028. Um, and I am unsure if the left should focus its energy on presidential politics like we did with Bernie Sanders uh, given the conditions. And so the three kind of points I want to make are around this and why I think that we should, why we, we're actually stronger um, than we were before and why that actually means then we shouldn't be invested um, in presidential politics in the same way. So first is 2008 is not like 2020. So the most broad, so in some ways what we're seeing is the third Obama term uh, in Joe Biden, but that there are some real significant differences in the material conditions that our country and the world face um, right now than it didn't then. And so some very superficial ones, but I think are worth mentioning are in 2008, the, the blue dog Democrats in Congress were a block that could leverage and, and reduce and the power of progressive legislation. Right now, they've been replaced by a more vocal squad who is much more progressive and broadly identifies with you know, the left wing of social democracy. Um, you have movements on the ground that, uh, that Patricia especially mentioned about the movement for Black Lives that aren't gonna be placated by a Joe Biden in the way that they were placated by Barack Obama. Although I do agree with her, there will be some reduction in militancy that inevitably happens uh, when Democrats take office. Um, and then the second point I'd make is that the, the, the Republican Party has also changed, not, in a certain, not for the better, uh, but they've kind of shifted from uh, neoconservatism to this kind of more right-wing populism, uh, neo-fascism neo as a dominant trend. And lastly, I really have seen, and I think we all have, and we'll go into more greater detail and briefly, the ability for the left to make substantive grounds in local politics, uh, which I really think would be the bread and butter of the next few years. So as I mentioned earlier, 
Uh, so like on my first point, so I mentioned that you have the superficial comparison, the superficial changes in the, in the nature of the Democratic Party where you have this block, the squad, um, kind of being more vocal. And I think they're also, but what's more substantive is that their efforts now are kind of focused on the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which is the largest block in Congress, but also the weakest, as opposed to the Freedom Caucus, which is the libertarian equivalent, uh, which really efforts to vote as a block. And so the CPC with the squad pushing it are making efforts to kind of wean it down and act more as actually a political force. Uh, but more importantly to me is you see that there are these growing other blocks um, of left, of genuine left, uh, both social democratic and democratic socialist political power. So in the in our revolution, which uh, Ethan mentioned, the Bernie Sanders aligned group has voting blocks in Somerville, Massachusetts, and growing power in Maine, uh, in in Chicago, New York State, and the uh, and and. Um, Let's see, let's, oh, in, in Washington, D.C., in the D.C. area, uh, where I was originally from, you know, you see tons of Democratic Socialists winning office um, and identifying openly as such. So that just didn't exist in 2008. And it really has to factor in the left's calculation about what it does. Um, so these, so, and then the Republican Party itself has shifted tremendously, really from this neoconservatism focused on empire and stopping gay marriage to one that's really more centering cultural issues around race and white supremacy and really building a caste system where you see like, well, that's why you can see gains with Latinos and some marginal increases in black votes uh, for Trump than you did in 2016. Um, and I think that's an important shift to watch because it really makes the Republicans more dangerous in certain ways domestically and in different in their terms of their foreign policy. Um, and then I think I just want to be conscious of time. So I just want to say that I, you know, my last point, which I'll really probably expand on the, in the Q&A is like, I wrote a piece in Jacobin with a comrade, Will Evans, uh, who, where we argued that socialists shouldn't pay attention to the presidential politics, especially given how weak the left was in 2012. And it pretty seemed inevitable. Obama was going to beat Romney anyway. And I am returning to that because I think Bernie Sanders provided a unique opportunity. Um, and I was reading uh, com my comrade Chris has had an interview in a, in a paper where he talked about the influx of new people and people putting energy into electoral politics. And I just don't think we're going to have a Bernie type figure again because socialism is no longer a novelty. Um, so it's not going to be that swelling of the ranks it was in 2016 and 2020 for us to have a a standard bearer like that. And I just don't think that there's anyone who kind of has his unique stature, even AOC, I don't think would generate the same seriousness in the presidential campaign. So I think our goal politically is to build the bench locally. So to have folks win, uh, prove they can actually do things. So the next of that segues into proving we can govern so that we can actually get elected to higher office and really be a building block, a, a building block is maybe not the right term, but I think, but being a major barrier to the institution of uh, austerity, which, uh, which uh, Comrade Connor talked about, you know, we're working with trade unions, working with community groups. And right now there was a big de debate in Chicago and one of the DSA members voted for the austerity budget and DSA has publicly distanced themselves from this, uh, uh, I think I think they're called aldermen in Chicago City Council. And I think those are the fights we need to focus on because that's where the front lines are gonna be. Um, so that's where I really see the left going because to answer one of the questions um, in the, what we were asked is like, I still see the central role of socialist organizations as creating socialism. I still view socialism very much as a long-term project, but one that's not necessarily gonna concretely happen in the next few years. And so I think that's better done through mass struggle at the local level than through education. At this point, what I feel would amount to educational campaigns, uh, whether they're in democratic primaries or not on the presidential level. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I'm sure that Patricia, David, Pat, Chris, I'm sure there's more you could say, but we'll definitely have time in the responses and in the Q and A to get all of the good details out of there. So next we have Pat. Okay. Let's get to, here we go. Right. For far too long, 
the organized left in the United States has, in my view, relegated itself to a position of irrelevance. Sex focused primarily in remaining sex and sustaining themselves, capitulation to the capitalist political system being mistaken for concrete advancement of the socialist cause. Campaigns that are so focused on achieving a political line that they become detached from reality and ultimately hurt the interests they seek to uplift. This, in my view, is the current state of affairs on the US left. What the independent left needs, and I use the term independent left often to describe those who have accepted, those individuals and organizations who have accepted a complete break from an opposition to the capitalist political system, specifically the Democratic Party in our case, is the only way forward for a mass socialist movement to be born. But what this independent left needs is to come to a place collectively where we are comfortable in our disagreements, but united in our strategy and convictions. And what I mean by this is that we build unity not from whitewashing our genuine political differences or devolving to the lowest common denominator, but of evolving to a place where we can respect our differences as comrades and come together in the same trajectory. In my opinion, the 2020 election could be a watershed moment for the independent left. For the first time in this century, much of the left found common ground through the Hawkins Walker presidential campaign, which served as a glimmer of hope for the potential of left wing unity in this country. From the Socialist Party to the Socialist Alternative, from the Green Party to three DSA locals that bravely stepped forward to support the campaign and caught a lot of um, flack for it. This campaign has demonstrated that the left is capable, the independent left is capable of self-renewal and embracing forward thinking progress. The Hawkins Walker ticket received almost 400,000 counted votes with more likely in the write-in states that would have been balloted except for the unprecedented interference by the Democrats. Now, if a vote total is one metric, just one by which to measure our progress, and let us note this was the greatest vote total for a socialist presidential candidate since Norman Thomas in 1948. This coupled with support from areas of the left that have little to no history of working together, as we all know, shows us that the sands are shifting on the left and the potential for a mass socialist movement is rising. Now, what we do with this potential, however, is up to us. The incoming Democrat administration will simultaneously lead an exodus of those who oppose Donald Trump primarily for stylistic reasons, as well as bring forward the so-called radicals that may oppose the excesses of Joe Biden's presidency, but will ultimately defend it because they wrongly believe they can pull a party of capitalism to the left. Now that we of the independent left have captured this potential through the Hawkins Walker campaign, we must find new ways to use it and move forward collectively to build a united left, while at the same time protecting our advancement from those who have held us back. The organizations and individuals that took a leap of faith in supporting Hawkins Walker initiative should have shown they are willing to move in this fundamental direction. But if our goal is the advancement of socialism in this century, whatever that may look like, we should expect nothing less than to do whatever is necessary to shatter the left's status quo and to build a new movement that is socialist, that is uncompromising in its convictions and is in complete opposition to capitalism and everything that maintains it. We know that socialism will not come from electing Democrats. It will not come from capitulation to the Democratic Party and it will not be advanced by those that believe pulling the current system to the left is compatible with the advancement of socialism. It may come from unshackling ourselves from the left status quo and setting out to create something better. It is my opinion that such a movement is possible and it's my belief that the left unity focus put forward by the Hawkins Walker campaign is a forerunner for great things to come if we want it to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. You were good on time as well. Our final panelist tonight will be Chris. If he can get his microphone on. 
Thank you, Ethan. Okay. I'm starting my timer now. So uh, thank you all for having me back. Now I'm gonna start off and I'm gonna answer the questions that were given to me directly um, without, without a lot of panache because to me, there is an overarching problem here and a very obvious trap or maybe not a very obvious trap, but a trap that can be felt, fallen into which is that you cannot think of history in the same way that liberals do. I'm gonna get into more of what I mean by this later but ultimately what I'm getting at is that history is the result of struggle. It is not decided by narrative. You can have, you can fall in a trap where you say, okay, this is going to happen because we will it to be so. This is going to happen because of immutable laws. Without struggle, there's nothing. So the only way then, because essentially what we're in is we are in an era of crisis, until there's solidified material gains, any, any minuscule grounds that are gained through a presidential victory, anything along those lines, we should define victory in such a loose fashion. I think that there is an issue that we sometimes run into is when we put too much faith in advances on the war position. It, that war does exist, that war is important, but it can be very, it's a very easy trap to fall into to say, okay, well, Biden is in power fascism is at bay for however long, or, well, now this is actually a place we can now argue. We now have a chasm open up for the left. We have, it is a very easy trap to fall into because it's very tempting. Now, only through socialism and the definition of that for me is the common ownership of all on the way to the abolishment of the class and the state. That's the only thing that is going to make a lot of these crises that we're seeing iniquities. Uh, if you look in places like Texas right now, there are cars lined up in the way we were always told that, uh, you know, a communist state would have to get to get bread. You know, the bread line has been brought back through essentially the fact that we're on the edge of a total economic crisis due to COVID-19. So when we really discuss the two parties in America, what I want us to understand that we're discussing is we're talking about a regressive traditionalist party in the Republicans, and then one we're going to call totally neoliberal. Now, neoliberalism is kind of a is a kind of a hot word on the left, so I'm going to define it so we have a definition here. Uh, essentially, it is the holy logic of markets and history. Now, we can all pretty much agree on the first. We pretty much live and die under capitalism. Both parties pretty much agree we live and die under capitalism. A uh, great example of this is just you know, you'll every once in a while you'll see Barack Obama go out of his way to make a sort of pot shot at the left or pot shot at communism, socialism, whatever you want to call it. I do think it's pretty important that we understand the way the Democrats who are going to be in power, however much power that is, they are going to have the office of presidency for the next four years or however long. We're going to say four years because that's what's precedent. They, this is a party that believes in both the invisible hand of the market and it also believes in the sort of invisible hand of history that everything ends up fine in the end and what they've and it really if you want to understand the democrats understanding of history the best way to look at it is the martin luther king quote uh which they have totally they have totally appropriated and they have totally taken out of context which is the arc of just the arc of the world bends towards justice well, it bends towards justice through mass action. This is through, these are through these rebellions. These are through the, these are through strikes. These are through these things. The Democrats have no interest in doing any of that. This gets scary when you start looking at the fact that Republicans actually do, or the conservatives, what do you want to call them in this country, libertarians, they actually believe that you can, they actually believe in using power in a political sense, through their base, through their power, to stop history. This goes back even to William F. Buckley. Uh, William F. Buckley defined a conservative as somebody who stands atop of history and yells, stop. They believe in their own power. They have a base. The Democrats have a captured base. This is incredibly important to understand, and they are further captured by the fact that now they have the presidency. So, We've got a new economic crisis. Joe Biden is not considering a lockdown or a stimulus of any way, of any shape, or 
he said, I believe that the stimulus would be smaller than what was given out originally. Student loans, which are a huge economic burden for a lot of people. He, basically what he's offered is a pittance. If you look at his transition team, it is, it is chock full of members of DuPont. It's, it's chock full of fossil fuel. It's chock full of all these. What, what his election is about is getting back to normal. Well, what is normal in America? Normal in America is essentially a divide between having, having landowners and having people who are not landowners. That's what the divide is. It is going to get, get back to that. I think that Patricia was very, made a very good point in to say that there is a, a lot of the terror that we see here is going to be exported out. The things that we worry about, we're going to see on a more national scale. Foreign policy specifically is going to be a lot more traditionally imperialist. The crises that we've been going under, when you see them talk about Donald Trump, they do view it as essentially, if you look at kind of a narrative arc, it's kind of the, you know, it's the moment it's where the bad guy seems like he has everything, and yet he's defeated through a simply the fact that the narrative that they're watching, when they get to the end, well, of course the bad guy loses. That's what's just supposed to happen to make it a happy story. And that's remarkably unmaterial. That's why they are so, that's why they are, that's why they are so hell-bent on fighting their own base. You know, the place where they have their energy was going to be in things like this summer, you know, these uprisings, And One minute, Chris. What was that? Oh, one more, one more minute. One more minute. So you can't really in any way trust them to intervene in history or in the market or any way. So what happens, there's going to be more crises, and that's going to be, up to the left to intervene in those constant state of crises. Now, we have to understand history as a narrative barbarism and a struggle against that. So there's going to be intervention. There's going to be intervention on our part, and that's what's going to fall on us. And in order to do that, our best chance to do that is going to be these mass work class organizations. And I would like to just stop and say one more thing about all this. And just because Trump lost, the impetus for classical fascism has always been felt. That doesn't mean it's going to go away. It has the classical fascism that we saw in Italy and Germany was the re direct result of failure. From so, I think that is a very important thing to keep in mind. Thank you. All right, thank you to all of our panelists. Now we're going to proceed to the second round of the three rounds. This will be a time for responses, um, time to ask each other questions, um, to, time to highlight, you know, what in each other's remarks you liked and what you didn't like. Um, I also took some notes while I was listening and I wanted to bring in just a few more topics for discussion, answer them as you will, address them as you will. Um, but you all said some interesting things and I'd, I'd like to hear more about them. So one is um, both, both Patricia and Chris, uh, you, you brought up the topic of history, right? And, and how I think Patricia, you mentioned that capitalism is not the end of progress in history. It's not like um, Fukuyama's book, you know, now we're at the end of history. There's, there's something else beyond this. And then Chris, you said that we can't look at history the way that liberals do and or conservatives, you know, you invoked Buckley with the stop history quote. Um, I'm curious to hear from you all, what sort of historical consciousness do you think is necessary? Like what kind of historical consciousness as a leftist, should we be should be really concerned about? Um, and also, um, a, a couple of you, Patricia, David, I believe, you you brought up this Trumpism phenomenon, and there's also um, the fascistic phenomenon that you invoked. Um, and Chris talked about how the Democrats have a have they have a captured base, right? Their their base is almost like hostage to the Democrats. There's no better alternative. I'm interested in, in how we reconcile the two of these. So I've heard it said on, on previous panels that we've had that, um, you know, this, this talk that Trump is a fascist, it helps the Democrats a lot, um, that it ke helps keep a stranglehold on people if you can have them afraid of the enemy more than they want to criticize the Democrats. 
And I'm curious, do you think that it's really fascism we're dealing with, or is it just ordinary capitalist politics? Um, does this rhetoric of fascism make it easy for the Democrats to do their thing? That, you know, by repeating the stuff about fascism, are we doing the jobs for the Democrats for them? Um, I'm, because there's, I don't remember what the final count was, but if there's 70 million people that voted for Trump um, and they're all, you know, fascist or, you know, fascist friendly, that would be, that would be a lot of people to write off for the, you know, the fight for socialism. So I'd be curious to hear how you think about that issue. Um, the Democrats and their their captured base. Um, David, you you mentioned that were th that 2008 and 2020 they're not the same year, right? There's a difference, and that today we may be stronger now than we ever were before. Um, and another thing is that socialism, thanks to the Sanders campaign, it's no longer a novelty. People are using this word socialism a lot. I'd be curious to have more of a working definition, what you mean by socialism, what is meant by socialism, and is it the same for today, the same definition that Sanders gives us as what it used to mean in history? That'd be interesting to hear about. And then, Pat, uh, you mentioned the highest socialist vote total since the 1940s. Um, with Norman Thomas, that the chances for a socialist movement today might be bigger than ever. Um, this, to me, raises questions about the prerequisites for socialism. The, the, there are objective prerequisites. We, we're going through like a massive crisis right now with COVID and the economic downturn. And, you know, to some degree, objective circumstances need to be in place. But, but I'm also curious about the su subjective prerequisites. Um, what kind of understanding and what kind of consciousness would be necessary to as you say, unshackle the left from its status quo. So, you know, any and all of these questions um, are, you know, up for grabs if you don't want to answer them, uh, understandable. But um, now I'd like to hear how you all respond to, to the remarks of your fellow panelists. And we can proceed in the, whoever wants to I was going to say, first. Patricia, do you want to go first? Just out of respect you. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. I'm writing some notes down, thanks. Okay, I'll just jump in <laughs> just because uh, of the awkward silence. Um, that's not my fault. Uh, so I just had a couple of points, um, but I will answer, I think, Ethan's great question first. That might have come also from Luke. Um, I hope I'm saying that right in the Q&A. Um, I just would be remiss to not mention it's the 200th birthday of one of my favorite philosophers, Frederick Engels. Um, and my favorite piece by him uh, that I read as a young man was, uh, you know, socialism, utopian, and scientific. And I think what left, that left a lot of important impressions on me, but it also reminded me that socialism really doesn't have one definition. You know, that's what he's getting at, partly, as he's saying that there's this utopian, scientific, and, you know, there's a million. So how we are defining socialism, not to be too much like Edmund Bernstein, you know, is somewhat a path that we're working towards that is defined uh, by when we get there, but largely, I think what I think we would all agree is about, you know, workers running society. Um, and the issue is, and I, is that like what socialism means to, it's a, it almost doesn't matter what I think socialism means. I think what I grapple with is that like, if you actually ask, socialism is ostensibly very popular with like 30 to 40% of people, depending on how you ask them. When you would, but you, you, you touch that, it's like, they may mean European social democracy, they may just mean highways, you know, I think like you have to grapple with that. There isn't a very concrete definition among the working people <laughs> about what socialism is. So we can talk that through, but, you know, I think we have to grapple with like, ultimately we are through struggle trying to go back to chapter 10 of capital, which I think we all kind of touched upon, which is that, and especially Comrade Chris, which is that you know we want to through collective struggle teach people how to build a socialist movement and then build a socialist society, um, and so I and that's why I was emphasizing the local stuff and like I was very electorally focused because that's how my mind works. But what Patricia does is really important. I mean, like I'm a rank and file public sector worker too. Like I haven't had a chance to get involved in my union partly because of COVID, but it's very critical that socialists play a role in their workplaces. My partner just started a union. Uh, and that was partly with the other leftists. You know, it's like, we are the advanced elements of the working class. I mean, there's not, I don't have a problem with the term vanguard in terms of like, you know, there are advanced workers 
who organize other workers, you know, and that's how you build worker power, as which I would, I like Trisha's the euphemism she used about dictatorship over proletariat. And, um, and so I, don't, I wouldn't use that term personally anymore, but I think that there is a sense of what we're building is a worker's democracy. And I'll just conclude on that, like, but ultimately going, when I go back to angles, it's about struggling where society is. So that's like the workplace. And also I think the elections are where people struggle. Like if that's why I'm not, I'm not interested and we could get to more of this in the, in the responses. Like I'm not interested in transforming the Democratic Party anymore. I think that DSA, that version of DSA is dead. But I just, I still see the ultimate electoral struggles that to me very specific with that term through the Democratic primary. And I just feel that's what's gonna happen. And we can talk that out later. Um, well, I can go ahead if with a few comments I had, thanks. Um, so, I mean, I think a lot of interesting things have been, have been talked about here. One thing I wanted to speak to, which was something I think Ethan brought up about, you know, that there were large groups of workers that voted for Trump and can we call them all fascists? I mean, no, um, I think that a lot of people that voted for Trump are misled and, um, that through organizing and raising class consciousness, people's ideas can be changed. I have a number of coworkers at Metro who were sort of interested in Trump because they're just fed up with basic electoral politics. And, you know, they sort of knew he wasn't really on the up and up, but they also didn't really like Biden or before him, Clinton. So, um, so but people need to be presented with an alternative. People need to have... Um, a vision of a better society. And that's what I think I view the Progressive Labor Party is trying to do and maybe some of the other panelists try to do um, in a different way is we have to show people that there is a, a better world is possible. And that goes to another question that Ethan brought up, which is what kind of historical consciousness you know, should we be promoting basically? And I think that um, a lot of what gets put out a lot of what pervades people's consciousness now is the ruling class idea is ruling class ideas. And um, like, for example, at Metro, a number of my coworkers, uh, they don't have really an understanding of the history of how we have the pay and benefits that we have now um, that th that came about through strikes, through strikes led by communists in the seventies. And that that's how we have uh, the great pension plan that we have, which Metro is constantly attacking. Um, so we have to, that is what we have to do every day is we have to try and counter those ideas that, um, that the ruling class puts out. We have to educate people about where power really comes from and how change really happens. And so that I, I view that as, um, as our, our role. And so I think that, you know, it's up to us to motivate the working class to, to take to the streets um, and, you know, rid our, our coworkers and fellow students that of the illusion that um, Democrats or Republicans have better ideologies. Um, I don't think that we should have to accept a lesser evil. I think that we deserve a better world and we, history has shown that workers can fight back. And so we have to keep pushing, um, pushing for that. Thanks. All right, uh, Pat. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, to jump off of Patricia's last point, I, th I think it's correct that the, the left has to offer an example, has to offer some form of leadership to the working class, because more, especially with the, um, the pandemic that Ethan brought up, you know, things are falling off the rails and they're going to be looking for radical solutions or you know, some solution other than what's been pre-boxed and given to them. So we do need the organized left to come together and say, no, it's not as simple as voting Democrat or Republican. It's not as simple as, just, as writing a letter to your congressman. It's not as simple as, as signing a um, petition where there are radical alternatives that exist, but it can't just be, here's a book, read about Marx. There has to be an actual movement that exists that they can you know, sink their teeth into and get involved in. And I think that's the part that the left has really failed to do. We have the ideology. We have the good ideas. We have the, I think now more than ever, we have a bit of momentum behind us, but unless we're offering a concrete movement, the, the working class can get involved in and take leadership of and make their own, 
if the best we're offering for them is go vote Bernie Sanders and pretend you're not voting for a Democrat, then sorry, that's not going to be good enough. And we're going to be stuck with, you know, people like Donald Trump getting elected, you know, trying to pretend that Joe Biden being elected is somehow better. And I think that's sort of the rut that we're stuck in right now. And that's why I keep harping on, I think Hawkins Walker has sort of broken that facade a little bit. Um, you know, I, I talk to Socialist Party locals all the time and they tell me since the campaign, they're talking to other left-wing groups and working with people they've never talked to before. Up until now, it's just been that other group that's on the other side of the protest that we don't go near. So I, I think there is sort of a realignment on the left that can help us um, come together in a new movement that offers a radical alternative to capitalism and the system that defends it, which in our case is the capitalist two-party system. Would you like for me to go ahead, Ethan? Yes, go ahead, go ahead Chris. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted me to wait until you said I could go or if I could just go. But, <laughs> uh, go uh, please take the microphone away. Oh, sure. Um, I think that one of that a lot of the question that we have of workers who vote Trump, people who vote and it's not in their own, essentially vote out of their vote abrogate to their own interests. That's a question that comes up a lot. And I think it really, really speaks to the importance of political education. And when I say political education, what I refer what I'm referring to is not read a is okay read the book you have to do you obviously it helps to read the book but i think that in these pockets of what we call the left i think that and this is one thing that i have really been strong about and why currently i am the uh, membership chair who also does political education and political programming with the uh, democratic socialists of america and the richmond chapter and have been doing that for two years the reason that we do that is because there is an entire history of anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist struggle that was taken up by everyday people that that has been totally lost or sort of erased from history uh, for the interest of a lot of things. You know, I remember in I don't know, sixth grade or so, um, I think about sixth grade or so, you know, I we would do these units and we would talk about, say, the Pullman strike. And obviously, the people who lost are put forward as the villains, and the president of the time is put forward as the victor. Um, because they were. They were the victor, but they are also the good guy. I, I realize what I'm speaking a lot tonight is about narrative, and I don't want to discount material gains or say that we can't talk about those. But the history that we teach is also very important. There has to be counter-programming. That's where organizations and their outreach has to become of paramount importance. We have to, you know, if you have a if you have a coworker who is who says something about, say, I don't know, Donald Trump and something that they're gonna do, et cetera, et cetera, and why they were gonna vote for them, you know, if you're an organizer of any of any salt, and this is a person that can be reached, and there's a lot of there's a lot of writing about contradictions and these things that people hold in their head that they don't really believe, but they believe because they're supposed to believe, right? You have to be able to intervene and be like, okay, well, what, well, why do you think that? What, what about that makes you think this? Well, this, or, you know, this or that. Okay, but and you continue to go down that road. Now, the same thing, and it's you see the same thing in unionizing, unionizing efforts. You know, people who are, you will, and I think this is something anyone who's ever tried to organize will speak to the fact that someone in their someone in their workplace will be anti-union, anti getting that democracy or fighting for it because of what they've been fed and the fact they've been told that it's ineffective. So education is of so much importance and we cannot discount that and we can't pretend that somehow educating people or trying to teach them at least the history of these struggles is this sort of elitist notion. You know, you learning is a constant thing. It doesn't have to be elitist. All right. Thank you to our panelists for the second round. Um, so in moderating, I thought of one more thing, sorry, but the, um, just a few moments ago, Chris brought up this idea that lately 
or maybe not so lately, maybe there's a longer history to this, there's been a problem about defining what a victory means for the left, you know, um, what concessions mean and what a victory really means for the left. And I think all of the panelists tonight, you've, you've talked about strategies going forward, um, but I'm also curious about how the past looks retrospectively. Was there anything that you all immediately think of that we could have learned from that maybe we should have considered it, we should consider it differently in hindsight? Um, I'd like to hear from the panelists on that. I mean, that question you... again. Oh, Chris, go, go ahead. ahead. No, Chris, go ahead. Because if you say answer, I'll probably I'll, I'll forget it. Sure. Chris, you want to go ahead? This is actually the immediate past. I think that in a lot of ways, without having the sort of, and I understand why it happened, but I actually am not totally convinced, and this is me thinking out loud, that the turn towards a Bernie Sanders victory was not exact. I. I understand why it happened and I understand the point of it, but I'm not totally sure that it was the best use of our resources in the last four years. Uh, I think that with, if a country is, if a country is nominally socialist and still imperialist, is, is it actually socialist? Is a, I think a pretty important question to ask. And I don't personally think it is, you know, if, there was an interview uh, where Bernie Sanders was asked, you know, would you consider a, would you consider a preemptive nuclear strike against Iran or North Korea if it came to that? And he said, sure. Well, the question should be, why are we even considering that that's a possibility? Why are we having this conversation about a preemptive nuclear strike against two, two countries? That's a totally, in, that's a totally insane proposition. And nobody thinks of it that way other than, the empire and what needs to sustain the empire. So I really am not sure that the history, you know, you again, this is all about building a base. Uh, David, Conrad David was very, very, uh, had a good point to make that a lot of this is going to be in more local elections. Now, as critical of, as critical of elections as I am and uh, turn towards electoralism, Building concrete power in local elections is by no means a bad thing. And I think that you would see that throughout socialist history when you had total areas of like, of say, Italy, uh, you know, Red Bologna, uh, you had Red Clydesdale in Scotland. That doesn't, that isn't more important, of course, than the actual ground level of organizing, say, your workplace, organizing your neighborhood. It is not more important than that. But I think that attempting to capture the presidency would, was on, would may have ultimately only led to, I mean, further despair and a, kind of losing the plot even more. All right. So um, maybe, maybe Pat can tell us sort of some of this history that Chris has introduced us to about what a political party, what a political movement used to mean. Um, that you know these socialists used to get people elected but it wasn't all about the election of course they were trying to organize civil society as well that was that was the model for these old second international parties uh, like deb's party um maybe you could maybe you could talk about that in your responses i think that you know the purpose why socialists engage in the capitalist electoral system isn't so much to get you know to get people elected obviously that would be nice and to be interesting to get an actual an actual socialist elected but the point is to use it as a platform because people tend to listen to candidates more than they listen to random person on a, on a street corner. You have a platform, you're able to attack um, Republican and Democratic candidates in a way that only a candidate can, if you're lucky enough to be in debates. And I think that's, that is the history of why socialists have attempted to engage in the process. Um, presidential is a little bit different because obviously you're not invited to those debates. Um, you know, but on, on a state and local level, that is sort of the point because people listening, you do get members and more supporters that way. Um, historically, the Socialist Party has always run or almost always run a uh, presidential ticket, as has several other um, uh, smaller left-wing parties. Obviously, our two um, most notable ones are Eugene Debs and Norman Thomas um, that everyone points to, especially Debs' uh, 1920 run when he was in prison for uh, protesting World War One. 
but that's why we use those platforms and they again they work to an extent they do introduce you to people people tend to listen more but they also have their limits and i think i think we've sort of come to the point where they've outlived um their old usefulness where every party um up until now you know they they run they have their campaign they have a good time they get maybe a couple thousand votes and we go home and we do it again in four years so all of this time and work and energy goes into these campaigns that don't really produce the results that equal the energy that went into it and I think this year we sort of turned that on its head and showed that a different way was possible where you can actually mobilize a real campaign you can get different organizations involved so it's not everyone just playing to their own audience and I think if we build on that not so much you know let's go elect more Democrats but we're going to do it at a local level this time since we didn't weren't able to do it with Bernie Sanders I think if we if we look at taking what we did with the Hawkins Walker campaign and replicating that at state and local levels, bringing different left wing socialist and communist organizations together in that mold. I think that's how we get a really strong electoral presence for the independent left. Patricia or David, do you have um, uh, thoughts? I was mm -hmm. gonna let Patricia go and then I'll have some closing thoughts. Okay. Patricia. Thanks. There's a few things up in the air here. There's the political party question. There's also the question of um, uh, what a victory means for the left and, and how the past looks like retrospectively. Um, what would you like to respond to? Um, well, I was going to talk a little bit, I guess, about like the role of voting or in the role of electoral politics and running candidates and things like that as a as a mean for producing change. Um, I mean, I agree on one level with what Pat's saying about this idea of you have to have some legitimacy to what you're saying. You can't just be a random person, you know, walking around saying vote for me. There has to be, you know, you have to have some legitimacy. You have to have put in some work. People have to see that you're willing to do some work. Um, and that, you know, was why I ran for shop steward at my bus division and you know, things like that, that you have to be willing to do work if you want to provide leadership to the working class. Um, but there's a difference between trying to lead a mass organization like a union of transit workers that has the potential to shut down the city um, when the KKK comes into town or shut down the city when, you know, another black worker is murdered by the police. Um, that, you know, political strikes, political actions like that, that you know, make the Metro workforce very powerful um, that, you know, that's working within a mass organization. So to me, that seems like, uh, you know, a stronger strategy than running for a local political office um, because you may be reaching people, but it's um, disparate, it's not focused. And it's also, I think, promoting the idea that that is how change happens. And as I've, you know, reiterated, I, don't think that we are going to be able to vote away the rich. Um, I mean, when I was much younger, um, I remember the Iraq war that really changed my opinion of what was happening in terms of the world, because it showed that the United States government will kill for a resource. They will kill for a resource. And so why wouldn't they kill us for trying to organize to take away their wealth or their power? So this idea that we could vote ourselves into power, I think is um, a failed strategy. I don't think that that is how we can really change society. Um, and I think that, you know, with politicians, they, you know, you prom they promise a lot. They say that they're going to make all these changes. And then when they get into power, all of a sudden they don't have any power. Like they get, I mean, all of a sudden they can't do anything because this group won't let me do it, or this group won't let me do it. So I think that, you know, we should, we need to focus on, you know, fighting for, fighting for true power. And that's mass organizations, um, the working class fighting against racism and sexism, and trying to build a entirely different structure to society without wages um, and without inequality. Uh, so, sorry, go ahead, David. No, oh, thanks. I thought you made some excellent points as did everyone else. Um, so I guess I'll be uh, a little contentious here with just, I think, not with an, an individual, but with like, I think the points being made. I mean, I think that people are kind of creating a straw person, uh, if you will, 
that I don't think anyone here has said we're going to vote our way to socialism. You know, I saw that in the chats. I see that, you know, you can argue that socialists can win and we can discuss is there, should they run as Democrats? Should we do independents, uh, independent candidacies represented by multiple parties? Should we not support candidates at all? But I don't think anyone has said like, you're going to vote your way to socialism. And I think that's where what Patricia is saying is correct, even though I think we look, we'll take it from different angles. So I'll talk about what I mean. You know, that you're building mass organizations that are doing different work, you know, so why brought up the trade union struggle, but there's also community organizing, you know, people need to see socialists actually doing work. And that's why if I didn't say it, I'll say it clearly, like the role of our organizations is to create socialists, because I don't think socialism is on the immediate agenda. So we need you know, as General Baker said, you need to turn fighters into thinkers and thinkers into fighters. And you need to like create an advanced uh, sector of the activist core that's not just like NGO trying to make the world better, you know, dogs and puppies, but is like, how are we gonna move toward capitalism? So I feel like people kind of keep saying that. And I'm like, don't know, I don't feel that's an, an honest argument. Um, and so I think what DSA is saying is that, and what I'm, where I come from, and I'll push back a little on my, my comrade, my organizational comrade, Chris, because everyone here is my comrade, um, is like, you know, I think that what made sense with Bernie doing it again in 2020 is, and I'll emphasize my other point, was that that's where people were, that's where masses were in motion. And that's the kind of one of my key criteria is like people were there, you could still grow DSA. I think that if people keep going back to the well to do that, that well is gonna run dry. So that's why I said in my first remarks, I think like even if AOC runs, I'm less enthusiastic because I do think that there was a unique nature to the Bernie campaigns in 2016 and 2020. In the same way, I feel that I understand people's annoyance, like every election feels democratic liberals are saying, you know, we have to defeat fascism. This time it was actually true, you know, in 2020, like I felt like it was actually true and they were the dogs, they were the people who cried wolf. So I just feel like the onus also here is that like, I would like to hear is like, I don't feel that I'm convinced by other electoral strategies because I do think like in the end, the masses wanna see material conditions changed and socialists in office can show that and they're much easier to win to be a socialist in office running as a Democrat. So I think that's the political fight we should be having, not whether not this broad like socialism through the ballot box, which is not, I think what anyone here, any is actually contending and it's kind of a, a straw person. Yeah, and I would like to, because I believe I kicked out everything off with that. That was by no means what I meant. Uh, to me, unions, all of those things are going to be ultimately way more important to what you can do socialism. Uh, you can have an entire city hall and due to class interests, if you say that you are going to If in any way you were going to say that you're going to, um, you know, shut things down, it, a, a city hall is never going to shut down the city. On the other hand, if you have a group of bus workers like Patricia's union who say, okay, we are not going to, so until the KKK are out of the city, this is all, of course, I'm making a hypothetical, we are actually not going to be running bus service because we don't want to be the reason somebody gets killed or anything like that. So I did, yeah, I did want to make sure that. It's pretty apparent. I'm pretty, I am, I would say I'm pretty electorally cynical. I just, to put it out there, I don't think anybody's saying otherwise, but I do want to just reiterate my own point that you cannot vote your way to socialism, but I've never believed that. So, so much good stuff came up in responses. Um, now would be a good time to move to our third and final round, the question and answer session. So from this moment, uh, 7.15, we've got about an hour left. And, um, and I, We'll proceed to the questions. Um, just for the audience's sake, uh, if you'd like to ask a question in, in the Q&A box, go ahead and do that. Or I can call on you and, and I can unmute you if you'd like to ask your question verbally. So one of the first questions is um, from Karen. How can people learn more about communism in the PLP? Oh, so, OK. So I should also clarify. Um, all of our organizations here represented, or movements, or that sort of thing, um, they've been invited to share their um, publications and uh, propaganda, for lack of a better term. Um, I encourage you all to share any links in the chat that you would like people to check more about. Um, and, and feel free to stick around for the post panel chat and, and you can talk more about the organizations and advertise them there. 
Okay. So the next question. Um, oh, okay. So I, I, I believe I already have asked this. I, David, you had a question um, from Luke about what socialism means to you in the modern context. Um, do you do you feel like there's anything you wanted to add to that? No, I feel I, I added that. I mean, I respect you if you want to add throw that to other people, but okay. I gave the Bernstein answer, which. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have another question. This is from Luke um, to all. What needs to change regarding the organization of the left or of the working class, uh, given new forms of labor as seen in the gig platform economy? And anyone, um, we won't proceed just in the normal order. Anyone can go that has a has, has a remark they'd like to share. So if I had to, so if I had to say with the gig economy, that again gets so back to the question of having these organiz of having organizations. We see there's something, and I think this is because you see these terms that are starting to get bandied about the internet a little more. Uh, something along those lines of, say, you know, there's going to be an Uber strike at on this day, and people just share it on Instagram. Well, a couple of problems with that. A, do the drivers see that? Does a does a driver who is not on Instagram, who I think it's very possible, you know, do they know there's a strike? Do the people who normally take Uber to work every day, do they know there's a strike? Well, if you have an organization, a union or anything like that, that works in conjunction with a party, if something comes along the lines and says, hey, we're going to we're going to have an Uber strike for X, Y, and Z reason. The unionist unions, which in America, they have been, they have in a lot of ways been captured by a pretty, you know, a pretty reactionary subsect or a, a capitalist subsect. In a lot of ways, if you have radical unions that prioritize the rank and file, those are going, those are still in a lot of ways the answer. There's a lot of cynicism about the way that a union is going to work with the is going to work with these gig economy jobs. And I frankly don't believe it exists. I also don't think it is fair to say that the way those are going to work is because we just will them into power. You know, there has to be organization. So there's my answer. Well, um, just a short example from uh, from local 689. I mean, the, the Metro Workers Union represents about 9,000 active, maybe 10,000 active members and a couple thousand retirees. And so whenever one of these small private bus companies would come along, um, like the circulator in DC is a good example, um, with lower, you know, paying the workers lower wages and things like that. Uh, we tried to unionize them and bring them into our union if possible. Um, that's how you can actually, um, you know, fundamentally help raise their wages and increase power. And, you know, if you have more workers in the same union, you can, you can sort of do it that way. And so I think that type of um, solidarity, you know, from the unions with workers in the gig economy could, could help because it is, does, it is a growing sector. Um, same with technology uh, workers, it's, you know, the pandemic showed a lot of people can work from home. So, you know, how is that gonna, how should we be, you know, doing that type of organizing too? Um, but I think that that, that's just one example of, of how you can support those, that type of fight back that's happening in some of these other sectors. Yeah, I think what I would just add uh, very quickly is I feel that we can't lose sight about how low union density is in this country. I think we all know that, but I think you have to also go from the intellectual of like, it's very low and they compare it to industrialized countries to like people never interact with unions and that's totally normal. Um, and that, you know, in the history, I'll relink link to it, but the history of the Young Democratic Socialists and the research, you know, lots of people said in the surveys we talked to, like, if it wasn't for DSA, I wouldn't have gotten involved in the labor movement. Because like, if you, it falls onto civic, very, it falls onto socialists to literally talk about the value of unions, because unless you're in a union, you tend not to interact with one. I mean, and so I'm saying unions are very valuable. And I think what, like what Patricia's talking about, 
is, is important. And I think they do it for their members, but sometimes there's that gap of people who aren't organized, who just don't know. And so like what groups like DSA do, it's not unique to DSA, but like DSA, when I was in DC, would have happy hours to introduce nonprofit workers who are a growing segment of the unorganized who could potentially be organized, you know, to like how to form a union, to talking through, you know, when I, DSA formed the emergency worker organizing committee during COVID. And I talked to, even though I was this former union organizer, I still felt good to like talk to an organizer, talk about what to do, you know? So there are ways to build these extra labor institutions by extra, I mean, just outside but adjacent that I think are really the role of socialists too, because we're in such a, a tough time and labor, you know, I'm not, you know, and labor also is very concerned about its own members and doesn't sometimes care about what's happening to people who aren't in unions. And so we have to build a better labor movement. And that's partly not just waiting for unions to do it for us. Yeah, the only thing I would add quickly um, <clears throat> as related to what the left has to do, I think it's just one update its messaging a little bit. So it's, you know, so it's clear as we have new segments of workers like the gig economy coming out. Um, sometimes I think parts of the left still think everyone works in a factory and their messaging reflects it. So I, I think we have to find a way to simultaneously make our messaging modern and accessible while maintaining the salient points where the, you know, the, the, it's still the working class, regardless of whether it's a gig economy or what they're doing, everyone's still part of that overall working class. So we have to find ways to be able to give off that messaging while making it accessible to those new, um, those new workers, those new segments of workers. Okay, so I'm going to bounce between the question and answer box and, and the live questions. Uh, next, we have a question, and I'm going to unmute you. Uh, Philip Brondo Giroux. Is that Luke? Are you there? Oh, you can turn your microphone on. Okay, hopefully they're getting there. I'll give them about 10 more seconds. Okay, seems seems that Philip is having a tough time getting his microphone on. I will I will come back to you in just a moment. Um, let's proceed to Tom Cannell. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask a question about like how the panelists sort of view the current political conjuncture. Um, you now it's kind of a commonplace um, in the media and elsewhere that contemporary mainstream politics are really polarized to an extent that they haven't been in the past. And I wonder how the panelists characterize the camps that are produced by the by this polarization um and um you know sort of i you know patricia basically talked about how finance capital seems to be supporting biden while and i assume that industrial capital is 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 seen as supporting trump and david talked about the neo-confederacy um being around the right and I, just, and I was just wondering in in general sort of what what the um panelists think the two camps are about and then following on from that is, does the left have any stake in either of those camps being predominant or is, or is that irrelevant to us? That's my question, thank you. Thank you, Tom. I can respond to, um, you know, we fit in a part of the question. Um, it, what I think about the, you know, the polarization and, you know, the current political climate is most of it isn't real. It's smoke and mirrors. Part of the way the capitalist system maintains the illusion of choice is by making it seem like these two choices are diametrically opposed to each other when they're provably not. The Democrats and Republicans may disagree on, you know, some burning issues of the day. Obviously, they run different candidates. But fundamentally, they are in agreement. Fundamentally, they uphold the same system. They might have a slightly, a very slightly different version of what that looks like. But fundamentally, they're both paying for the same team, and it's not us. So I think with the 
you know, the left has to offer, offer a radical alternative to that while pointing out that the, the choice people have between um, the Democrats and Republicans isn't really a choice at all. Yeah, the, the only polarization that I personally care about, and the only polarization that I think is worth discussing, and this is not to say that differentiating between the two, but when people, but I'm referring more to the way the media talks about it, right? No, it is true that Wall Street and plenty of, plenty of sat- sectors of capital did come out more, were more supportive of Biden than they were of Trump. That's actually true. However, when it comes up in the media context, to me, the polarization that I most, and the camps that I'm most concerned about is I'm concerned about who has power over me and who else, and then I am also with the people who they have that power over. I care about who has power over me. That's kind of the number one concern I have. I am lucky in that because of, because of education and being around a group of people where I have access to those ideas, I can put things in that framework. And that is a good way to kind of cut through the smoke and mirrors that we refer to. However, the pa- however, there are people who do not have that framework. And it, it, that's why outreach is important. We have to get people speaking on those terms. We have to get people to understand that your boss essentially has as much power over you as anybody. So as far as camps go, which camps I'm rooting for, I'm rooting for mine. Uh, whether there is a more, whether there is a more genteel faction or a more rabid one in power. As long as they have power over me and I have no control over my destiny, I'm not rooting for you. Yeah, I mean, I disagree. I think that we have to recognize that we live in a polarized society and that's not, that's just, you can't just say everyone has false consciousness. Like if people identify more strongly as Democrats, more strongly as Republicans, they tend to swing votes less. What's key is we live in a polarized society with incredibly weak parties. I mean, that's always been the United States' issue. And like, so I think a concrete example of what I'm talking about is, you know, national groups that these will pull out support from local races. And, and by, so what I'm, and this is a phenomenon where there is actually kind of a realignment that did happen, not in where there's a broad sense of what's acceptable in both parties. Um, and to get actually support because lots of races end up getting nationalized. So that means all the attention is on Georgia right now. And this idea of mythical swing voters don't exist. So I think it's you have to look at then the parties really do represent are really coalitions because they're weak, which is why I think it makes sense, you know, to focus on it, to be interested in what the happens at the Progressive Caucus. I'm interested in what happens with socialist electeds in the cities I mentioned and municipalities before, you know, and so I think it's just too dismissive to be like the polarization is just smoke and mirrors, you know, for, because that's how people identify. And the key thing for us is to figure out how to get them to identify more broadly with the movement for socialism. And I think that partly means like creating fractures and uh, and within those institutions. And so that's where I disagree with you guys more on the political, less almost as a left, leftist and more as a political scientist. I think those are real polarizations. They're just not able to express themselves in the usual sense because we don't have part, strong parties that workers and voters can use. So they kind of sort of just like, okay, that's my party. I'll vote for them. Great. You know, I really hate the Republicans. I really hate the, I really want to own the libs. But they don't, as you guys say, but what's true is like the people at the top like are very limited in like what they actually do and want to want to actually enact. Um, I'll just be very quick. I think that um, I think that, you know, there's sort of an amplification of differences, but not really an amplification in each sort of change, actually. Um, So I think that, you know, Trump sort of emboldened the more virulent racists in society. Um, And I think that it's you know, that's always been there. Um, and it used to be more seriously fought, um, literally in the street. Um, the, uh, you know, I remember the KKK when I was in high school, marching out of union station 
and, you know, we threw batteries at them and, you know, but that was a long time ago, as I said, when I was much younger. So that hasn't really been the atmosphere. So because of that um, and, you know, the rising, I would say the rising rivalry with China, putting the squeeze more on the U.S. ruling class, therefore putting more of a squeeze on the, you know, working class here in the United States has led to this sort of amplification of, um, of racism. And I think that we have uh, not done enough to fight that. And I think we need to um, do more to fight that. Well, so th there's been this invocation of, of race and racism. Um, and I'm curious, how do you all think that that res relates to some of the other things that have come up about class and class struggle? Um, how do you think that those two issues relate? Um, because I know on previous panels, um, there's been a back and forth between some panelists that think class is sort of this outdated idea and, and that is not the way we should be organizing today. Um, but then there's also the idea that there's this, this is sort of a wrong dichotomy, that that framework is fatal and, and it positions us within the existing politics of the, the Democratic Party, like how they try to organize an alliance of, of minorities and organize voters. And so I'm curious, how do you think about the relationship between race, class? What, is it, what does class really mean? And, um, and maybe we could discuss that for just a moment. Well, I just want to chime in first on this one because, um, you know, building, fighting racism and building multiracial unity is very distinct from the identity politics that are pushed by the ruling class. That identity politics serve to keep us divided. They lead to representation within capitalism but not to destroying capitalism. So I just, I, I wanna make that distinction. I'm not sure if that's what you were saying, Ethan, but um, that, that fighting racism is not the same as um, identity politics. Um, and I think that if you ignore the role of racism in capitalism and ignore the importance of building multiracial unity, then your movement will be reverted back into a capitalist one. I think Occupy DC was actually a good example of this. Um, I went to Occupy DC all the time. And, you know, I even snuck a couple of <laughs> activists from Occupy DC onto my bus division to speak to my coworkers about what was going on because, you know, they were, you know, shutting down streets and setting up camps and all my coworkers were like, what's going on? So, but Occupy DC, you know, had two fatal flaws, I think. One, they didn't have a disciplined organization leading, providing leadership to the movement, and they did not address racism. So there was, no, there was very little happening across the river, as we say, in more predominantly black parts of DC. And eventually um, Occupy DC became sort of vote, let's vote for the Democrats a type, type scenario. So, um, so I think that that's just, that, that's my piece on that. Yeah, I mean, I'll just jump in quickly because I alluded to it uh, in my in my remarks. I mean, I first I want to say like I agree with what Patricia is saying. I think like I mean, I think like like socialism and identity politics can mean a lot of things, but I think we all agree here that we don't want more multiracial, multigender balanced CEOs. Like that's not the world we're fighting for, and we see how identity politics. And I was listening to Cornell West on the dig. No, he really got into like he said it more obviously more eloquently than I am because he's Cornell West. But it's like that it's about solidarity. Like our job is to build solidarity, not just across class lines. And what Patricia also said really well earlier, it's under helping white workers understand that actually anti-racism helps them too, you know, and that it's a tool and we have to build a multiracial coalition. So the two points I want to make are this. So because your question was about class, like I think what, what made Trump unique in the 21st century, but not unique in history, is he's very much a George Wallace populist. So George Wallace is often forgotten was not explicitly anti-union. He knew how to break off segments of the labor movement. And that was Trump's goal. I don't think he was sophisticated enough to do it, but he wanted, he wanted to break off police unions, some of the, some of the industrial unions, to like at least their membership. So he wanted to like their membership, I'm for you. He, so 
to paraphrase the IRA, it's like he doesn't have to build, unite the whole working class. He only has to unite one part of it, you know? And so you have that issue where he can use class in a different way than we can, because we want to build a multiracial working class movement. And so, you know, class really is how race, race is really how class is experienced in this country. So by that, I mean, you know, where you are tends to be how your oppression is tends to be done by class, but it's, it's much harder to leave your classes based on your race. Uh, so what I'd say is, you know, I really think people have to understand that I think most people do, but it goes against the liberal version is like, there is a caste system in this country. It's not just like white people and everyone's equally oppressed below them. I think that's like why the term people of color is so bad. It's like, it's blacks are really at the bottom historically because of slavery, whites are at the top and who is white has changed over the time. And there's divisions within that. And so you can have Trump build a coalition with Latinos who might identify like they're better than African-Americans with some uh, Asian Americans who also would view that way or view themselves as better than Latinos. So he can play to those divisions. And so I think you have to offer material gains and do public education. And there's no easy answer. It's just really convincing people. And it's part of the trade union and the workers movement that just all our broader thing is like convincing people that their interests are shared with fellow workers and, and with also understanding that anti-racism is very important. And that's a workers, that's a class issue to do that because if people view it from an individual lens, whether it's the neoliberal I'm really glad there's a CEO at American Express who's black, or it's like, I don't, to the very crest, well, I got mine, so who cares what happens to that person? You know, we have to, you have to break down both of those. And so it's, I'll just stop there because I want to give other people a time to talk. But I just really, if there's one thing I've been telling people a lot, it's like, don't view white supremacy as whites and then everyone else is equally oppressed because that's not how that is, that's not how the society functions. And that it helps you understand the Trump coalition a lot more. Okay, so I'll go ahead. Oh, Pat, did you have something quick to say? I, I, I was just going to add very quickly that, that I think the, the key, because I never really understood why the left felt, or some people on the left feel like you have to divide out class issues from race issues, you know, where if, if I focus too much on class, I'm a reductionist, whatever that means, or if I focus too much on race issues that I'm not focusing on abolishing capitalism, and it's real, you know, that they are both interconnected, and I think that's where our messaging comes in, where it's not a which one's better, which one's more important. And I think that's what, what the entire argument gets framed around. You know, we have to make sure our messaging is clear that capital, that abolishing capitalism will solve the class issue, will empower the working class, and it will also make great advancements um, to abolish racism and, de and deal with um, issues there. So, um, I don't want to force you to speak, Chris, but in your opening remarks, you said something about uh, socialism to you means the abolition of the state and the abolition of class as an idea. Um, I wondered what if you had anything else you wanted to say about what class means to you in that sense. Uh, well, to maybe this was a misrepresentation on my part. I, I referred to, and this is kind of the classic Marxist understanding, or my understanding of the classic Marxist understanding, of the idea that you have socialism, which is on the way to communism. Right. That's what I was referring to more. Uh, I really will say, I think most of the panelists have covered what I was getting at. What I would say, though, is that fighting racism is a, it's a, you know, it's a trench fight. It's very much something that you do um, on the ground. Um, I, it, in order to build solidarity, you have to be there with the people in your community who are most affected by racism you know you you have to reach out to them you have to say hey you know i'm not going to get everything right but we're going to work together and we're going to move towards and you're going to and we're going to build solidarity because we are members of the same class now when i say class what i'm referring to is do you sell your labor right um if you have to if you I mean, that's, I mean, I think that's really all I have to say is that if you're a person who is under the under the strictures of wage labor, then you're a member of the working class. So, I mean, that's really all I have to add there. Okay. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, in the interest of time, I'm going to proceed to more questions. And, okay. um, and 
as snappy as you all can possibly be, you know, maybe try to keep responses to under a minute. Um, I'll, I will encourage you to do the same. Um, we have a question in the chat from Ann Doni. Between 2016 and 2020, there have been shifts on the left. For instance, some of the Trotskyist groups from the 1970s, like the ISO, but not only them, have been lost. Um, also notably the WSWS, the World Socialist Workers site. I, I'm not familiar with the, what the acronym stands for, but you know, the SEP and that sort of thing. Um, they, they're championing the Civil War historians against the New York Times on the 1619 Project. And we've seen Trotsky's groups do this at the same time that DSA members are routinely appearing in the New York Times. How does this changed landscape in the last four years impact the prospects for moving forward in the next um, several years? And how do you panelists account for these changes on the left? Um, so I'm just gonna put in the chat after this, my history of the Young Democratic Socialists of America, which actually covers some of these questions because um, you have to talk about the whole left when you talk about the youth section, so watch that. I will say, you know, DSA, what I get to in that history is that DSA benefited by the collapse of some of these other organizations. And I think part of the explanation is simply that when there was a mass swell of interest, DSA's barrier to entry was very low, you know, and that uh, their Leninist groups, you know, have a higher threshold for historic reasons. I'm just, that's saying this is an objective fact. Um, and so it was much easier for DSA to get people who are emotionally trying to join something right away, then groups like the ISO, and the ISO also suffered because of the sexual harassment and, and rape uh, case and just collapsed from that. And so you had, so with that collapse, you did DSA springs up. So the media also then looks for a socialist basis. And I think that to a certain extent we could agree, you know, DSA comes off as more palatable, you know, for historic reasons and as a, and also for some luck of its own, you know, by the being called democratic socialist, Sanders the democratic socialist, you know, so it gets more calls for the media. So what does that mean long-term? I think that's a really great question. Okay, I would just add quickly, um, if you look at the, the left over the last 10 years, it, it looks nothing like it did 10 years ago. You have, obviously you have Occupy Wall Street, you have um, Donald Trump in the picture now, you have um, Bernie Sanders, um, radically changing how um, the average person understands socialism. You know, somehow to the average person, socialism has gone from, you know, Cold War era Soviet communism, communism to, you know, essentially just rehashed New Deal politics. Um, and then like, um, like was already said, you had ISO's collapse, um, you had DSA, um, you know, becoming closer to the Democratic Party and growing in membership as a result. Uh, you have the Green Party, which is historically anti-socialist, nominating a socialist um, for president. So you have sort of all of these things happening at the same time, and it really amounts to a massive realignment of the left that I don't think is done. Um, I think that's going to um, continue as we go into Joe Biden's presidency, um, as the Green Party sort of reckons with their uh, vote total from the 2020 election. So I do think we're definitely going to see more uh, realignment and more sand shifting which is why I keep bringing up the point, the, you know, the parts of the left that are outside of the Democratic Party that aren't content with how the left looks right now, those are the groups and individuals that have to continue coming together. So we don't just let the left, the, the left to sort of sink into another rut, we can actually build ourselves forward. I'd like to say that I think that the reason you're seeing the resurgence of the left is that the points in time that it seemed like things were going pretty hunky-dory and things were working out and all these all these things i don't think that's I mean, it's obviously not the case anymore we saw essentially in 2008 we saw a i mean we saw essentially a giveaway to the billionaire and capitalist class um, in the interest of banks being too big to fail you know we've those old terms have been made as the crisis, you know, as we all kind of hurtle towards these crises and these crises get even more strong. As we get to those things, uh, 
the answers that were given the as conventional wisdom are no longer hold up. And, you know, it is the atmosphere that we currently live in. It is so obvious that something big is coming and things are not going to be good. And I think a lot of that is sort of a almost psychological kind of like repression of the psychological repression of essentially the fact that global warming is going on. Those old, those old answers that we gave, America's the land of the free, and if you come here, you get it, unlimited opportunity and all these things, they just simply don't hold water the way that what they once did during, say, the post-war when you saw the biggest, you know, prosperous. We didn't, you know, speaking as a pretty young person, I don't know everybody's age, I'm only 28. I never really lived in a world where that was a thing, you know? the crises is only accumulating. The crises is only getting bigger. So so on this issue of crises um, that Chris has brought up, and Pat just a moment ago said there's a kind of shift on the left. There, there's an ongoing transformation of the left. That may parallel ongoing shifts in capitalism, how neoliberalism is falling apart and there's something after it, but we're not sure what that looks like. Um, there's a question in the Q&A that sort of dovetails with that idea. And I'd like to ask it now um, from Wes. For all the panelists, how can the left engage more constructively with the right? Millions of workers voted for Trump, but is it helpful to merely write them off or argue that their vote didn't align with their objective interests? Does the way that the left thinks about the right contribute to its own weakness? And I would just say that um, part of these crises that happened in capitalism and on the left um, usually involve breaking off parts of the voting constituencies, breaking off the established rackets that the Democrats and Republicans rely on. Um, and so, with that in mind, how do you how do you all in address this this idea of um, the engaging with the right? So, question. So, when we say the right, we've got to define what we mean. Do we mean the? Do we mean people who voted for Trump? and are reachable do we mean because to me it depends on what you mean by the right because when i hear the right i don't necessarily think immediately of somebody who may have i mean who essentially did a wrong who did the wrong thing um are you talking about people who are just slightly reactionary in some way now in that case the, those people you have to reach you have to attempt you have to make an attempt uh, but to me, it's important to be able to identify what that means because you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna waste my breath trying to convert a proud boy. You know I'm gonna if some if somebody is going to if somebody already has a vested interest in hurting me in mind, then I'm not gonna I'm not gonna help them or try to convert them in any way. So again, are people who vote for so really, that kind of leads to another question. Are people who vote for something already, are, are people who vote for something the right, or is it the people who have the power and put that forward as an option? So I will just tell an anecdote in is that I remember before the left blew up being at one of our classic small meetings um, and this person comes from an anti-war group and I remember touching their literature and it was incredibly well printed it was such a in contrast to like the photocopying I was used to and later they mentioned they're like well we're working with lots of people like the United for Peace and Justice the Cato Institute blah 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 you know and I was like oh that's where you got the money <laughs> um so, I mean, there are these examples where people do. I think you can make that judgment yourself if that was correct. And I think, like, just as people who voted for Trump aren't necessarily fascist, people who voted for Sanders aren't so necessarily socialist. So I think Chris says it best, how do you define the right is the key thing. And I think, yeah, I think through collective struggle, we want to win over workers who may vote for our reactionary forces. But that doesn't, I don't see what their organizations and leadership, I don't find common cause. And that's my view. What I would just quickly add is, you know, 
obviously there's a lot of people um, who voted for Trump and support Trump um, who we would never reach out to. Um, you know, but we're not going to discount every worker that voted for Trump. Um, I mean, if you look at it from, from 2016, you know, they have a system that's not working for them. And most of them saw, you know, they had two choices between someone who, um, obviously not saying I support her, but on paper would have been one of the most qualified presidents in history. And you had a live hand grenade. And these workers who, even if they didn't have the ideology and didn't have, um, you know, the words to express how this, how um, the system was hurting them and how they opposed it, they just saw the live hand grenade and they went for what they perceived to be a radical option, sort of bucking the status quo of the system. So those are the people we can reach out to, even if they did vote for Trump in 2016. It's not that they, you know, some of them did, but it's not that all of them supported everything Trump did or, or even support Trump himself. It's just a disillusionment with the system and we have to win them over from this right-wing populism and show them that there is a viable alternative to this status quo, to this system. It's just not from that direction. Okay, so I'm going to take another question from the Q&A. Um, this one is um, from, an, it says an anonymous attendee. Uh, to all the panelists, why are parties currently so weak and why is the current strategy of organizing, um, why does that strategy not seem to be working, even though it worked in the past with past revolutions? Um, I think, uh, I think that um, a big part of it is the fall of communism. I think that people think that there, that nothing else can work. And so there's a certain amount of cynicism that's been bred because of that, um, that, you know, the mistakes of the Soviet Union and China and Cuba to some extent, you know, that these countries that made attempts. Um, and so, you know, instead of feeling like, well, we can learn from that and do better, and we have to try again. And like I said before, this isn't the best we can do. We can organize society in a better way that doesn't have people, you know, fleeing their countries on lifeboats. And, you know, so, so I think that, you know, but I think that that has really um, permeated the consciousness of people that that this is what we have and this is all we can do is is what cap is what capitalism has given us offered us. Um, so I think really the and then I think the lack of communist leadership in the unions um, has really impacted the ability to um, spread those types of ideas and build. Uh, power within uh, unions as, as uh, you know, low as their populations may be. Um, so I think that that's a big part of why organizing is very hard, um, is, is, is that. Thanks. I mean, my answer, because I don't necessarily disagree with what Pat Bridger said, but that could be because parties have always been weak in this country because we don't have traditional parties. We have a ballot line uh, that people have access to, you know? And so it just, it just messes up how parties have functioned in this country, you know? And there's not really, so that's why I was curious when you said it worked better elsewhere. I was, and that's where I would have been curious to hear more about that because I don't actually think the more things change, the more things stay the same, you know? And I'll just, that was, I'll give you that. And Pat or Chris? I would just add briefly that I think the, <clears throat> the left has for a long time been in a sort of um, rut where it does the same thing over and over again and somehow expects a different result. <clears throat> and I, you know, I think as part of that realignment um, that we were talking about a minute ago, we are seeing the left you know, approach new organizational models, um, new strategies, new movements. So hopefully with that, we'll see the left um, change where it doesn't just keep doing the same things over and over again and thinking that, you know, they might work this time. Okay, I'm going to take another question from um, the live. I got to find the unmute button. Um, oh, 
No, they lowered their hand. Okay, never mind. Well, then we'll take another button, uh, another question from the Q and A box. Um, this one is coming from uh, Sebastian. To what extent is labor unionism possible as a strategy for gaining power as socialists, as unions are occupied by the Democratic Party? Uh, they are tied both through misleadership and structural reasons. Um, do labor unions need a new form for a new age? Are unions necessary for a socialist movement or are they historically necessary form of the past? Um, I, I just to maybe tease out some of the thoughts, I, I guess is is a union in, is a union necessary for socialism or is it just sort of this historically contingent thing? Um, and then how do we how do we understand the unions today? Are they beholden to the Democratic Party misleadership? Are they organized structurally, you know, for the Democratic Party? Um, Any one of the panelists that wants to take on that question may do so. I think it's important to not fetishize a. I think it's important to not fetishize a tactic in. When you have an overarching, you have an overarching strategy, and fetishizing a tactic can lead you to some not great ends. That being said, I think in a workplace, a union is, I mean, beyond necessary. Uh, if you have one person who can dictate the entirety of everything about eight hours of your day, if you have no way that you can speak against that, then eight hours of your day are under the control of another person. So. With that being said, I don't think unions are historically, I don't think they're a thing of the past. I don't think that they're just historically of that. I'm for working class democracy. I'm for a multiracial working class democracy. And unions have been a huge, have with absolutely made mistakes, but have also been a huge part of that. So. Um, I mean, I wanted to, uh, just say two things. One, I mean, unions are capitalist institutions. I mean, they definitely are there to soften, you know, the blow to the working class that, you know, the capitalists are, bes are bestowing upon us. So um, I do not necessarily think that, I, I think that after a revolution, I don't know what the socialist folks on the panels say, but after a communist revolution, I don't see why we would need unions. Um, I also just do want to say, though, that although, um, you know, the numbers of people in unions, that I think that the power that um, a mobilized working class group like the Metro workers, um, the power that they would have to lead working class struggles uh, can't really be overemphasized. Um, so uh, I did want to say that. Um, I also think that part of the reason people don't really like unions is because unions have been pretty terrible. I mean, our union, my union is pretty terrible. And, you know, they, they really capitulate a lot to management. They never organize around where our power is, which is labor, meaning they never want us to be strike ready. The union leadership never wants to talk about being strike ready. Um, and, Instead, I, I agree with what the poster said about they were occupied by the Democratic Party. And um, so I think that that, you know, is part of the reason why people are disillusioned with, with unions um, in a lot of ways. Thanks. Okay, uh, I'll move ahead to the next question. This one comes from um, an, another anonymous person. Uh, what does it mean to run socialists on the Democratic Party ticket? How does this relate to the historical Marxist understanding of the necessity of the political independence of the working class? I don't know. I, I, I'm very curious what the cat thinks, but... Um, oh, sorry. Probably... That was actually Chewbacca. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my I mean, email just... alert. Yeah, I, it makes sense. I thought I saw Pat's cat uh, earlier. So oh, gotcha. Um, so I think that the best way to answer this is like, I mean, I always cheaply go to chapter 10 of Capital where Marx talks about, you know, how you have to have struggles to really show folks what's possible and succeed on small levels before you can imagine that, we, that voting for Democrats is really just a tactical 
element. And that the real question, which I think there's a lot of unity here, is we have to build organization outside. And that's why I reject the idea of transforming the Democratic Party into a social democratic force with a small d, small s. Um, because I don't think that's where you're going to get independence. I don't think the party is structured to do that. Um, I think the party exists as an apparatus to be a broad tent coalition between capital, labor, and some other progressive social forces. Um, so you can't really square, but Marx also was visiting a, a party of workers, which we, we've had those parties of workers, and they've also been captured by capital too. I mean, the historic social democratic parties, you know, ended up instituting neoliberalism in Europe, you know? So it's like, and so I'll just end with a great joke when someone said Gallus Humor. So the only reason DSA didn't go neoliberal is because we never had state power, you know, because it was like every other social democratic organization the social international did, you know, to a large extent. So you always have to take those also like the independence the green salt because capitalism is an incredibly powerful hege hegemonic force. I mean, if the question is, um, what does it mean to run socialist um, in the Democratic Party? And I say this respectfully, then it calls into question whether or not you're actually a socialist. The Democratic Party exists as one part of two to hold up the capitalist political system in the, in the United States. I think the I think the parts of the independent left can have disagreements and discussions about how we should relate to the electoral process. If we run candidates nationally, if we run them locally outside of the Democrats, if we don't run at all, if we focus um, solely on movement building. But when you enter into the capitalist political system, even if you you know you're primarying people, even if you're just using it as a ballot line, you become part of that system you are upholding that system. So you can't say simultaneously, I'm not part of the Democratic Party, but I'm participating in something that is integral to the existence of the Democratic Party. You can't have it both ways. I think that's the, um, probably the primary difference between what I call the independent left and those who believe they're on the left, but exist to uphold the Democratic Party from a left position but still believe their power runs through the Democratic Party, the Sanders, the Ocasio-Cortezes of the world and the people that support them. Uh, Tricia, was there anything you wanted to add maybe about the independence of the working class uh, from the Democratic Party? Or do you think you've had your fill? Okay, uh, Chris, how about, how about yourself? Yeah, at this point, I think that going the Democrat route, I there's nothing anybody is going to gain from it. I think that it's proven to be a historical mistake, uh, as we are all pretty aware of. the The common line of the Democrat Democratic Party is the graveyard of social of social movements. I think that's been proven to be pretty true. And again, I. I think that there, if there's one thing that the U.S. left is incredibly weak on, it is international policy. And as it stands, the international record of the Democratic Party is under all means totally unforgivable. And to attempt to be a part of that is something that I think if you're going to be a serious socialist, a serious communist, a serious whatever, whatever you identify as, but if you are attempting for working class democracy and working class power, it's there, you don't gain any, you, you need to define what your games are if you're going to work with them. Because the international record alone, I mean, just the absolute destruction that the party has put upon the world is, I mean, to me, it's pretty unforgivable and it's totally abrogate the, most of my beliefs. So I think, um, Maybe we have time for one more question, and this will be interesting to hear about, especially considering some of the remarks made earlier about how um, one way you could evaluate where we are at now on the left is uh, in terms of how it relates to its own history. There were some thoughts that we're in a really good position, that you know we're in a stronger position perhaps than we've been in quite some time. This question is sort of in, in opposition to that idea. Um, we have a question in the Q&A from Gabe that says, the left has lost much influence and power over the past 50 or even 100 years. 
do you think it is important to acknowledge the left decline in order to move forward? Why does so much of the left refuse to come to terms with this regression and decline? I guess I'll go first. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it's true that you know the left has lost a significant amount of influence and power. Um, it's in a position now where um, you know it's um, disjointed. There's who knows how many different organizations, different tendencies, different everything infighting. It's you know, so the, it's really no surprise that the left has so little power given the state that it's in. Um, and I think some people are frankly comfortable with that. Um, you know, they're comfortable maintaining their own sex, their own, you know, small corner of the left. If I have my correct political line and I say things the right way, then everything is perfect. And then on the other side, you have people <clears throat> who have essentially traded in actual left-wing political power for, again, working in the Democratic Party. So you sort of have these two extremes that have been holding the left back. And again, I think the restructuring and the, the changing circumstances of the left will is putting it into a position where it can grow again, where it can actually have real influence and power again as a radical independent movement. Um, we're not there yet, but um, as Ethan said, I think we're, even though it's true that we've lost a lot of power and influence, we are in a good position, I think, to, you know, to emerge in this new decade and really gain some serious ground again. I mean, to go back to what Chris said originally in response to another question, but how are we defining the left um, is a good question I would have for the person making this good inquiry. Um, I mean, in certain ways, the left, if we're describing it as like, social democratic forces, you know, that supported Bernie Sanders to the PLP, you know, it's, it's actually more vibrant and stronger, you know, that was a point I made in my original point than it has been in about five to 10 years, but also institutions are a lot weaker than actually a power. So like, we can, I think we all have criticisms of the labor movement here, but labor is very weak. And if the labor movement was a lot stronger and the left had more power in it, that would be a lot more meaningful than a handful of electeds like scattered around the country you know it's like it's a very it's it's a very hard time for any mass democratic organization to have power that's not that's to the left of joe lieberman um so so it, it's really so it's like how you slice it like i think that there's a, the left is more powerful culturally in terms of what people want to identify with it and on a smaller scale politically but in terms of labor force you know I don't see it. I mean, even because I think we have to remember historic context, like as bad as labor leadership has been, there were more ostensibly socialist, you know, related to probably DSA, people of more powerful unions that were trying to support what DSA was doing than there are now, you know, <laughs> you know, I think there's a real and so it's, it's, it's how you cut it too. Um, I mean, I think there's no denying that we're living through a period of very low class consciousness. Um, and that's why we have to keep doing political work all the time so that we can be prepared when, you know, different opportunities arise, um, to have more power and, and push, you know, have more leadership among the, the working class. I just wanted to say that I think that while it's true, like I, you know, I agree that we are in some ways sort of at a low point. I think that there are a lot of very bright spots. I mean, I think that the rebellions that took place after George Floyd's murder were um, very inspiring. It showed that there are large numbers of people that are incredibly brave, that are willing to stand up to the police and to the state. And so I think that we can't um, you know, lose sight of that, that there are still people that want to fight and are angry and believe that something else is possible. Um, and that that was something that, you know, actually, you know, had international influence and shows that there is potential. So I just wanted to, you know, reiterate that how inspiring that was 
um, even though we are in a period of low class consciousness, I think. Any other responses to this final question? Okay. Well, I know if we were all in an auditorium together, you'd get a hearty round of applause. The best I can offer you right now is a clapping emoji. I do apologize. Um, but I, I do want to thank you, Patricia, David, Pat, Chris. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak on this panel for the Platypus Affiliated Society. Um, right now, we're going to end this, this great conversation, but we're going to transition to another room for a post-panel discussion. Throwing that in the chat right now. There you go. So... Um, anyone feel free to join us, maybe take a break, warm up some food, go stretch your legs and then come back for a good conversation. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and inviting me.